Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going to talk about questions regarding usajobs.gov, the federal hiring process, anything revolving around government jobs. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to answer some of the questions that were previously submitted, and then I'll look in the chat, see if we have any questions in there. So the first one is from Brian Wan 5732 who asks, can an agency terminate telework if the job was posted 100% remote work? If so, what are your options? So there's a clear distinction between telework and 100% remote work. And in order to show you that, I'll go ahead and pull up my screen so we can take a look at it. And Oftentimes, this is somewhat confused. So if you see here on usajobs.gov, if you go to more filters, you can see in the location area, there is offers telework. There's about 9,000 jobs right now that offer telework. Not every job that offers telework is actually categorized as offers telework. So you could run across some administrative jobs that do have the potential to be telework that is not even listed on the job announcement. So this is telework. Then if you go down right below it, remote jobs. And right now we have only show remote remote jobs. And if you were to do that, you would see right now there's 300. There's 377, which is kind of low because over the last 12 months, that number has been between 400 and 600. So this probably has something to do with the um, with the budget and how things are going in Congress right now. But this is 100% remote work. That is the difference. Now, if you caught my video yesterday, then I spoke about the possibility of a new bill being passed that essentially allows agencies to revisit this uh, telework agreement and also the remote work status. So every 12 months, the agency is going to look at it and see if that position still meets their needs. So in the event that it doesn't meet their needs, then potentially you might have to come back into the office or you'll have to renegotiate it. Now, as it is right now, if you're applying for 100% remote work, I would feel pretty confident that the job is going to stay 100% remote work. So hopefully that helps. The next question is from Taylor Tinian 8359 who asks, I am graduating in a few months with my bachelor's degree in business administration. Well, congratulations. I have also worked as a business office manager for over four years. What GS level should I be looking at and what series? Okay. So the answer, if you want to use your, your uh, business degree, then you probably want to go to the 1100 series. And I'm going to bring that up right now. So from USA Jobs. Dot gov. If you hit search, you scroll all the way down to the to the series section. I would look at the 1100 and primarily 1101. So this is 1101. This is where the majority of the business positions will be at and 1102. Now, I talk a little bit more about 1102 because people are interested in into getting into contracting. But if you, as you can see right here, we have over 400, 400 jobs today for 1101 and over 200 jobs in the 1102. Now, that doesn't mean you can't keep looking down here and see if something else better fits your experience. Like production control, you have 65 jobs. But the rest of the jobs, you're not going to really have that much. Now, you say you have four years of experience so and, and a business degree. If you look at 1101 and 1102, what you will see a lot of these positions, they're going to ask for either a bachelor's degree in business or they're going to ask for 24 semester hours in uh, business classes. This is like finance, accounting. So you should have that with your degree. You're going to have to look through here and see what matches your experience. What I would say for you is probably you have four years of experience. So I would probably look at the GS 11 grade, depending on your location. Your location is going to matter. You see how it's written here 24 semester hours in accounting, business, finance, law, contracts. This is going to be typical for the job announcements in the 1100 series. So look at that. If you're in a major metropolitan area, it could be higher, but what's really going to be important is how you word your experience in your resume how you make it relevant to the job announcement. That's what's going to matter the most. Okay. Let's get rid of that. 
All right, next question. Next question is from Lynette Bledsoe, who asks, I've been referred to a hiring manager so far 11 times since August. How do I know if they moved on or filled the role? At this point, I have not received any additional emails on status besides being referred. So the answer is to really to keep applying. A lot of times you will not hear back from a referral. The next step, the next step from a referral is to get an invite to interview. So right now, the gatekeeper for referrals is human resources. You're getting past that. What you're not getting past is the hiring manager because the hiring manager is going to select who they want to interview based on resumes. So your resume is ending up in the hiring manager's hand. They're just not deciding to, to pick you in order to interview you. This could be for a lot of different reasons. Maybe the other resumes look more appealing. Maybe there's somebody in that other pile they might know. For whatever reason, they're not picking you. Or you might just need to keep waiting. <laughs> Sometimes it takes multiple months to hear back. But what I do suggest doing is I suggest tracking your referrals if you haven't been doing that. And I'm going to show you what I mean. Tracking referrals or just tracking your status when it comes to applications on usajobs.gov. You can use usajobs.gov, but to me, that's not the best system. And most people, I think they use, um, they use Microsoft Excel, which is fine. But what I've been using recently... I've been using Notion. I don't know if you're familiar with Notion, but it's free. You can create an account on Notion. And I'm going to show you a, a system that I developed. And that should be popping up right now. This is what I use right here. So just like Excel, you have your columns and you have your rows. What I, the reason why I think it's important to keep track of this is you want to see what percent of your referrals are actually generating interviews and what percent of your applications are actually generating referrals. So you can see here different statuses. Um, these are color coded and you can change it. Uh, this, is, this is for an individual that I was assisting getting a GS-15 over the summer. And if you scroll to the far right, there's a category called likelihood of getting hired. This is subjective, but you can see 5% too early to tell, 10% this person was actually referred, not referred is 0%. They had an interview, but it was weak. Tentative job offer only assigned an 80% value to that. They ultimately got a job, a final job offer right here, final job offer, 100%, right? So you can track it like this. And if you go to the second tab, this shows uh, the applications, the interviews, how many were negotiating job offers, how many were hired, and then you see not referred. So this person, uh, 13 not referred, 23 referred. Uh, this is not counting the actual interviews. But what you really want is a 50% referral rate, especially if you're applying a lot. So if you're applying 20, 30 times, you want to see 50%. You apply 20 times. 10 of them should get referred or more, ideally. If you're not getting that 50%, you have to relook your your resume and not just relook it. You have to be more deliberate when you're making adjustments before you apply to the job announcement. That's what that means. So one, it could be just a generally weak resume. Two, it could not be tailored to that position. So have a tra tracking mechanism like this. If you want to use this uh, Notion template, there's a link in the description where you can you can download it. But have something. If you don't feel comfortable with Notion, use Microsoft Excel, use Word, whatever you want. But just I would keep track of it if you're applying in a large number, right? So if you're applying to two, three, four times a day, like I often recommend, if you're doing that, then you should have a way to track it. Okay, so hopefully that helps. And let's take it back. Um, let's take a look at the chat, remove. Okay. Good morning, MC. Greetings. It's the No Notice Live Show. <laughs> Good morning, Matt. Fungi Thompson. Good morning. I have a question. How has this government shutdown affected federal careers? Well, Fungi, there hasn't been a government shutdown. The next one or the next uh, the next deadline that we're facing down is November 17th, I believe. So if that occurs 
then it's going to impact uh, hiring across the board. Hopefully that does not happen. We have a new Speaker of the House. Hopefully they can get some action going in the House of Representatives and Congress can get something going. But um, it would it would definitely impact it. Uh, even if it's a continuing resolution to say January or April, that would still impact it. We would like to see a full clean bill passed so that the agencies you know, have the full amount of money and they don't have to worry about a little bit going here, a little bit going there. So until this whole um, this whole spending bill is passed in, in clear and full, there's going to be a certain degree of worry. But if you're a person that's interested in getting into the government, I wouldn't let that discourage you. I would continue to apply. I'm willing to wager there's probably a good percent of people that don't even want to apply because of the potential government shutdown. Use that to your advantage. And while they're sitting on the sidelines, start applying. And even if it shuts down, when the government resumes, they're going to pick up the hiring process where they left off. So it's in your best interest if you're looking for federal employment to continue to apply. Next question, MSM41009. Good morning. My resume is eight pages long. Is that considered too long? The answer is yes and no. It is considered too long for certain agencies. I was just looking at a job announcement from the Department of Homeland Security the other day. And in that job announcement, it says we will not consider anything past page five, meaning that they will not read your resume after page five. So if you have an eight page resume, the last three pages, they're not reading it. But that was the, Depart the Department of Homeland Security. That was for, uh, I believe it was an immigration agency. Not every agency follows that rule. Some of them have it in there. I think Coast Guard, there was a few job announcements that had the same language. So for a lot of agencies, eight page is not a big deal. There's people that have 10, 12, 15 page. But what I would encourage you to do is relook your resume, look over your resume and see, is everything in my resume relevant to the position that I'm applying to? If you're applying to be a budget analyst, look throughout your experience. If you have experience on there that's over 10 years old, look at that and ask yourself the question, is this relevant? Should I have it on here? If you're including certificates that have nothing to do with the position you're applying to, then perhaps you can remove those. So I don't want to tell you that it's too long, but what I would, what I will tell you is to read the entire job announcement before you apply and see if there's a limit to the resume. And hopefully that helps you out. Good morning. All right, let's see. Let's go back to the questions. All right, next question is Alvin Loves Medicine, who asks, what's your best advice for a student federal employee? I'm in the pathway program and I'm considering to be a contract specialist or an FBI ATF DEA agent. Okay. Seems like you're in an internship right now. So I recommend finishing that internship up with a strong evaluation. And as far as the difference, there's two huge differences here. You're talking about contract specialist, which is in the 1102 job series. We just looked at that. And like I mentioned earlier, you need a bachelor's degree, which it looks like you'll have 24 hours in business classes. Now, when you're looking at FBI, DEA, and ATF, all those jobs, for the most part, when you're looking at special agent positions, they're going to be in the accepted service. And I wouldn't recommend for D, DEA and FBI, do, do not go through USA Jobs. There are some of them there on USA Jobs, but they're going to lead you back to the, to the webpage of FBI. So let me show you. Let me, let me show my screen. If you want to apply for the FBI, I would go straight to their page right here. And it says special agent. You can see average salary here. This kind of falls in line with probably GS-11 to GS-15. It's on a different pay band. Um, and then make sure you meet the eligibility. If you scroll down here, there's a lot more requirements than just being an average federal employee. You got to do the urinalysis. You have to do like a physical examination. Uh, you have to go through an academy. It's a whole process. And it's probably a little bit longer of a process. There's also a top security clearance that you're going to have to have more than likely. So for DEA, same thing. 
go to the actual web page of FBI and DEA. If you want ATF, ATF is uh, usajobs.gov. You can apply to positions on there. Um, but I tell you what, if you want a government job sooner rather than later, probably 1102 is your best bet, your contract specialist positions. So look at that. And before I go any further, if you are still looking for a federal government job, make sure you sign up to the free newsletter down below. The newsletter sends out virtual hiring events. So I think there was like four of them last week or this coming week. You can sign up for free every week. I send you a list of the most recent federal hiring events. And um, some of these are on usajobs.gov. Some of them are not. Like I noticed a lot of them on the Peace Corps side, a lot of them Department of Interior, and there's a couple of other agencies. They don't necessarily feed their information through usajobs.gov. So I go ahead and scrape their websites and I push that information out. So make sure you're doing that. Okay, next question is from Mick Empire MC 4003 who asks, what does it mean when a former employer receives employment verification from a federal agency? What, what can be the next steps? How long will the process take? Why are there so few job postings on USA Jobs? Okay, so a former employer, employment verification, that means they're verifying that you actually worked in the company or the organization that you claim to work in. The entire federal hiring process on average takes four to six months. That's the default standard answer. Most of the timelines that I look at that we see in the federal government, that is the timeline. Now there's people that get hired in three months. There's people that get hired sooner or a year or more than a year. And as far as your, la uh, your last question that says, why are there so many few job postings? Let's take a look. Let's take a look and see how many job postings on there, because I think there's about 30,000 right now. Um, okay. Let's take a look right here. So you see 13,000 open to the public, and then you see 28,000 for federal employees. There's going to be crossover between these two, but let's just say 30,000. There's about 30,000 um, jobs open right now that you can apply to. You can literally spend the entire day applying to jobs and you wouldn't come anywhere close to the limit. Now, what might be holding you back is your location, uh, your experience, the job series. I don't know what job series you're qualified for. If it's one of the more obscure job series, then yeah, perhaps you have limited opportunity. Now, what I have seen is this number fluctuates. Sometimes this is up to 30, 35,000. Sometimes this is up to 16,000. It is kind of low, historically speaking, throughout the year. This is a little bit lower than what we would have. And that goes back on what's going on in Congress right now, honestly. Uh, once we don't have any shutdown worries, any budget concerns, this number would probably go back up. But like I said earlier, keep applying. All right. Let's drop that down. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I think we have another question. Yeah, another question from Brian Juan, 5732. Any advice for a GS 14 15 080, 0830 series looking to get a 100% remote job? It doesn't have to be an engineering job. Yeah, 0800 is the engineering. If a person were looking for 100% remote work, then I would look at uh, probably 0300. And if you have IT background, 2210, there's not many in the 0800. Let's jump back on USA Jobs real quick and see. Let's see. Okay. Let's take a look right now. We only have a, we only have 300, um, a little over 370. Let's see what what those jobs are. 0300 is always in the top is always in the top five, so that's going to be a good bet for you. Um, let's go straight to zero three. So right now you can see right here, 34 plus 27. So we're looking at close to 61. There's 61, hundred percent remote work jobs. You have an engineering background that will include administration. Administration is one of the key components of experience that you need for the zero three oh one job series. And also the zero three, four, three, you have analytical skills as well. So there's 61 opportunities for you. Let's look at 08 because that's what you are. 08. Yeah, look at 08. 0801 is 10 and 0810 is 11. So if you're civil engineering, but I don't think you were, I think you were mechanical engineering. 
So you could qualify for some, there's 10 of them. It's probably highly competitive in the engineering field, but there are 10 0801, 100% remote work. Let's look at 2210 real quick. Okay, 61. So if you have IT background, look at 2210. If you do not, and you want to lean into your administrative experience, look at 0301 and also 0343. And that might be your pathway to 100% remote, but make sure that resume is strong and relevant before you start applying because the competition is pretty fierce when it comes to these 100% remote positions. Okay. All right. Let's look at the chat. Um, we have one from PMART. Good morning, PMART. Can you speak to why locality adjustments often don't make sense when comparing the cost of living between cities? For example, Colorado Springs has a lower locality adjustment than Dayton, Ohio. That, <laughs> Yeah, um, I can't speak in detail to that. I know there's an annual pay board that convenes once a year in order to do the calculations. And they look at certain career fields within that city before they make that adjustment. But <clears throat> in my estimation, just, just what I know about Colorado Springs, it should be higher than Dayton, Ohio. Um, frustrating, I, I understand. Uh, good morning, Noah. Good morning, morning, Jarrett. All right, what's this? I got a question. Can you briefly give your opinion on what's going on with telework? And do you think it will sustain with just one day a week? Or do you think it'll be more days a week in the office? Honestly, I think it'll be more for the majority of us. I think if you look at remote work, I don't, I do not think remote work will ever go away but I think it'll be more favored to critical skill individuals. So I think it'll favor more so the IT folks and um, maybe some of the other uh, critical skills type individuals. When it comes to administrative type jobs, uh, the 0300, maybe the 0200, I think it'll still exist. But the political pressure that you're seeing around the DC area is they want federal employees to be more in the building, more in the office. And it's for a variety of reasons that people can either agree or disagree with. Now, one of the main reasons that they're using to try to get people back into the office is that the, the customer service rate is low. With Look at uh, the Social Security Administration, look at the VA, customer service is low. And because of they're, they're looking at people working from home saying that could be the reason why which it doesn't make any sense because before the pandemic, the customer service is low. Government customer service is always low compared to the private sector, right? It's going to be low. Another thing is people have been abusing it, unfortunately, but people abuse pretty much any type of program that you roll out. Whatever is there, people are going to, there's going to be a small segment of indiv individuals that are abusing it. This happens with remote work. People across the country, they don't like the idea of, um, government workers staying at home. And then you have the, um, the cities and the towns that are affected because the people are not going into the office and they're not stimulating the local economy. And there's just a lot of issues with it. So I think in the near term, there's going to be a concentrated effort to get people into the office. Around the DC area, a lot, a lot of the agencies right now, they're having people come in at a minimum once a week. Not all agencies, but the majority of them. And there's been talk to increase that number starting January, starting January, February, the beginning, the beginning of next year, they're looking at perhaps doing twice a week. Now, could it escalate beyond that? Probably. But uh, I don't, I don't envision it being 100%. Like, um, even before the pandemic, it was never at 100%. Telework was being used way before the pandemic. So I think it's a political hot topic right now. So you're going to hear more and more stuff coming out about it. But to answer your question, I do think that eventually it'll probably, the norm will be twice a week for people that are teleworking. Okay, next question. Um, next question, MSM41009, question. I currently work for an accepted service agency and I'm looking to transfer to a competitive agency. What is the easiest way to transfer to a competitive agency? 
So if you're, it sounds like you are a government employee, your SF-50 says accepted service, and you're trying to get into the competitive service. So the first thing I would do in your situation is I would look and see if you have an interagency agreement so that you can apply to competitive service jobs. If you do not have that agreement, I would look to see if you have any special hiring paths. Are you a veteran? Are you disabled? Are you a Native American? If you do not have any of those, then you're somewhat restricted to the open to the public jobs. You would have to apply to open to the public jobs that are in the competitive service. That would be the way to do that. I would probably need a little bit more context on your situation. Um, next question. I have, from Titus Carlson. Good morning, Titus. I have my bachelor's. What other work experience should I show when applying for a contract specialist? I'm currently a I'm currently at 1101 position, okay, for over six years. Well, Titus, let's just take a quick look and see. You want a contract specialing position, uh, contract specialist position. I mean, <clears throat> some of these are written the same. Others are going to have different, different um, language. Let's just take a, a jump to the first one here. This is a GS11 to GS13. This is what they want you to have. So they want you to have experience leading a new award from solicitation through completion. So do you, do you have experience leading a new award? Do you have experience conducting relevant research and analysis to correctly apply regulations and policies? You probably do. Working as an 1101, you probably have this experience. It needs to be worded in this way. You need to have on your resume as an achievement that you conducted research and analysis and what was the impact of you doing that in your previous job? Do you have experience analyzing and evaluating cost and pricing data for proposed and ongoing procurements? You might have that experience as well. These words need to be in your resume. Now, what about this? Participating as an active team member for a competitive request for proposal. I don't know if you have that. So. You would have to go through these job announcements. That's one. Who is this for? This is actually a remote job. So let's let's look at a different one. This is the GSA. Open to the public. Okay. And for this one, it has less less of a requirement. This one wants you to have knowledge of formal advertising and negotiation of procurement procedures sufficient to develop solicitations, evaluate offers. So go through these. I, I would say you're interested in 1102. Look at at least four or five different job announcements and you will see, like we just looked at two that, that mentioned solicitations. And then you're going to have to see, can you, does your experience line up with that? Can you perhaps change a few words Maybe use a couple of synonyms, right? Maybe you don't have the word evaluate or negotiate on your resume. Maybe you can use some synonyms to flip it around and now your resume lines up more for this position so you can transfer. You can apply to the 1102 as an 1101. So I would look at that. All right. Next question. Maria. Good morning, Maria. Interviewed for a government position about a month ago. References were contacted the next day, but I still haven't heard anything back. Status says I'm that I am a top public candidate. Should I follow up? I normally, I would follow up. If you interviewed a month ago, I would definitely follow up. Usually the advice I give is after you interview, if you don't hear anything back after three weeks, I would follow up. So you interviewed, which is great, and then your references were contacted. Usually that's a strong signal. They only usually check the references of the, the top one, two, or three candidates. Now, this isn't every agency. There are some agencies that do the, do the actual reference check before you even interview. I've heard of that as well. But for the most part, if they're going through the trouble to check your references, that's a good signal. Um, but everything in the government moves slow, unfortunately. Definitely check back up, say something uh, along the lines of, I'm inquiring of a status update. Would you please provide me a status? I interviewed at this date. Could you provide me a status update? Something like that. All right, let's see. 
Next question. Alex. Alex. Good morning, Alex. Do direct hires from private to government have the ability to negotiate salary step? Yes. If you are moving from the private sector or from the military to a federal government job for the first time, or it doesn't even have to be for the first time, if you're coming from outside the federal government and you're applying to, the, to a government position, you have the ability to negotiate your step level. And the way that's typically done is once you receive a tentative job offer, you accept it. And as soon as you accept it, right after you accept it, you send the human resource specialist a memo that demonstrates why you're a superiorly qualified candidate. And then you request a higher step level. Do that. A lot of people do not do that. I would recommend doing that. All right. Let's go back to the questions I have over here. Next question is from Fat and Bearded. Any tips for reinstatement eligible person to get rehired? Okay, so if you have reinstatement eligibility, you do not have to compete with the general public. Um, usually you get that because you've already spent three years in a competitive service uh, job. The tenure block on your last SF-50 should be checked. Uh, so make sure that you attach the correct SF-50 and start applying to the competitive service jobs that interest you. Reinstatement works pretty much whatever you're qualified for. So you still have to be qualified for that job, but attach your SF-50 and start applying to get back in. I don't know your, your background. I don't know exactly what experience that you have, but that would be my recommendation. Next question is from Elizabeth Williams, 4653. What does bargaining unit mean? Okay, that means that the position is eligible for union membership. When you first get into the government, if your if your position is covered by bargaining unit, that means uh, you'll probably get a form that asks you if you want to pay dues to a union. And you can fill that out. And I think dues are something like, what, $9, $15, $20 a month, something like that. Even if you don't pay the dues, the union, I believe, is still obligated to represent you. But um, not everybody can uh, can be a part of the union. If you're a supervisor, sometimes if you're human resources, you cannot be a member of the union. So that's what the distinction is. When you look at the job announcements, It'll some positions say this is a bargaining unit and other ones will say this is a non-bargaining union. And I would encourage you just to look at it. If this matters, if you care about this, make sure you're reading the job announcement. Because there are some positions that are not supervisory, and for whatever reason, maybe they're in headquarters in a certain office, and it'll say non-bargaining. Um, but this is usually discussed more uh, during onboarding. Next question is from Sun is on IMF eight. Do you recommend USA Jobs Resume Builder over uploading your resume? So both. I recommend both. If you're if you're newer to the process of applying to government jobs, you would use the USA Jobs Resume Builder because that will not allow you to leave off critical information. There's certain information in there, like how many hours did you work? It forces you to put that information in there. So if you're new to the process, I would say use it. Another reason I think everyone should have it, when I, when I mean it, I'm talking about the USA Jobs Resume Builder, is because certain agencies, they only accept it in that format. Coast Guard is one of those agencies. There are some sub-agencies in the FAA that only take resume builder format. So you should have one ready to go in that format. Now, if you're used to the process, if you know what information needs to be on that federal resume, I would prefer to use my own resume because you can make it more appealing and you can, there's no character limit. So if you have one position that you've held for 20 years and you want to add more achievements, sometimes on the federal resume builder on usajobs.gov, they'll give you a character limit. Well, there is no character limit when you're creating your own resume. And if you want to draw special attention to a specific achievement, it is easier. I find it easier to read the format when it is, um, when it is your own, when it's on a Microsoft Word document. 
as opposed to looking at a usajobs.gov uh, resume. That format is just a whole bunch of blocks. It's really hard to see the font. The font point is really low. Excuse me. But to reiterate, the answer is both. Have both. I prefer using your own resume. All right. Let's see. Next question. Titus, I'm currently an NAF pay grade, GS7, GS8. How high, how high do you think I can jump on the GS side with six years of experience? Uh, if you had the relevant experience, I've seen people in the NAF actually jump quite high. So as long as you can demonstrate that you have the relevant experience, um, yeah, you could be, I mean, you could get GS11, GS12. Um, you know, really, Titus, I would have to like read your resume and, and um, look at the job announcements you're considering in order to give you a better opinion. Okay. Uh, Jerry, good morning, Jerry. Do you help write government resumes? I keep getting referred, but nothing after that. So what I do is a few different things, right? At the very low end, I have a lot of uh, videos on resumes. Excuse me. I have a lot of video on resumes. If you follow those videos, it'll help you create a stronger resume. I also have um, resume examples. So if you're interested like in the 0300 series or the 0500 series, I have written a complete resume for the 0343, for the 0340 job series. So you can download that link in the description below. You can also schedule a call and I can review your resume. Or if you'd like me to edit your resume, I can do that as well, but you would have to sign up for the course. Also, link in the description below. If you sign up for the course, then I will go through it and I will edit your resume. But what I really hope to achieve if you do sign up to the course is I want you to learn and to develop the proficiency on how to create and update a federal resume on your own. Because I think it's a valuable skill set that everyone should have that you're going to need multiple times throughout your career. So. I really want you to learn how to do it. I will guide and help you through that process and I will edit it in order to ensure it's at a high competitive level. So I do offer all of that stuff. Links in the description below. Thank you for asking, Jerry. All right, let's go back to the questions. Next question is Yin J In TV9023. That's a that's a long name. Who asks, is the government 5.2% pay raise at the end of the year still happening? Is the government still going to be shut down on November 15th? Well, it's not November 15th. It's November 17th, I believe. Is the pay raise still happening? Yes, as of right now, it's still happening. Um, so what will end up happening is in December, at a certain point in December, the president is going to submit an executive order in order to lock it in. So until then, it's it's not 100% certain. But everything leading up to that point right now, all indications are we're going to get to the 5.2%. It's not 5.2% for everyone. It's 4.7% across the board. And then in the high locality areas in the major metropolitan cities, they'll get 5.2%. So if you go look right now, and you won't have to because I can just show it to you. If you go look, there's already people showing you the pay chart. So check this out. This is Fed Smith, but you can go to, there's a bunch of websites that are doing this. You see right here, estimated 2024 pay scale. So a lot of websites have already taken the trouble to calculate the pay raise. Now what you'll see here, this is Russ. So this is a uh, rest of the United States. This is not a particular metropolitan area, but this kind of factors in the 4.7%. So if you're curious on what the 2024 pay raise is going to look like, and if you just want to see it on the Rust pay scale, it's not going to show you like the DC pay scale or anything like that. You can just Google it like I did, and you'll see it right here. 
all signs are pointing that this is still happening. So uh, that's the best answer I got for you. Uh, all right. Next question from Rashid. Rashid, who asked, I'm looking for an entry-level administration job with the government. Can you help me? I have a bachelor's degree in business, and I also speak three languages. I don't have much experience, except I worked a few months with the TSA. Okay. Entry-level administration job. That can mean a lot of things, Rashid. First, if you have a bachelor's degree, which you say you do, that could be GS6 or it could be GS7. That's kind of entry level, depending on what your GPA is. If you have a master's degree, then a GS9 is entry level. I would look at the 0301 job series. If you're after administrative work, that's where I would start. Now, you say you know three languages, so I don't know what languages those are. But if you wanted to leverage your languages, I would go to USA Jobs and look it up. So check this out. I'm going to go ahead and go there right now. Let's see. We're going to go there now. All right. So go to usajobs.gov. And this is for anybody, really. Anybody who's interested in any particular skill set that they might have. What you do is you go to keywords. And if I go to keywords right now and I just type in the word language, it's going to pop over 4,000 jobs. And what you're going to see is a lot of jobs that ha that require a specific language, like this one, Russian, Russian, or Mandarin, Chinese. What's better is if I knew what language you had, and then we could just type it in. That would even narrow it down more. This one says Arabic. So let's say a common one is Spanish. If you know Spanish, there are certain jobs I want you to know Spanish. So you can, and then also use your filters here. So if you are, if you are constrained by a location, make sure you have your location, your job series. So that way it narrows it down even more for you. But I would look at that. Do a search for the languages that you have if you're interested in pursuing a job that requires that skill. Or look at 0301 if you want the entry level administrative job. And I would look at GS6, GS7. If your GPA is 3.0 or higher, look at GS7. Also, let me see. You said you didn't have that much experience. Um, entry level with no experience. Yeah, I'd probably look at GS6. And I would also start volunteering. You want to have some experience, even if it's not paid experience, to be somewhat competitive. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, God's favor. Thank you for joining me. Next question is from Ting Bai, who asked promotion. How do I, how do people get promotions? Okay. So as a GS employee, you're eligible for the next higher GS grade after 12 months. If you're in a promotional ladder position, like let's say the job announcements from GS seven to GS 11, and you can, you can find that out looking on USA jobs. I'm going to go ahead and show it for, for some people that might not know it. I'll go ahead and show it. So here, you should, like right here, you see this GS 11 to GS 12, that's a ladder position. GS five, GS seven right here. It's a ladder position. And also if you go into the job announcement, you will see the full performance, uh, the promotion potential, the full promotion potential that'll say nine. So they're hiring probably maybe at the GS5 level, or they're actually hiring GS5 through nine, but this is the full promotion potential. If you're in a position like that, then every 12 months you can get promoted. It's not really automatic, um, but it is probable. And what you would need to do if you're in this type of position is make sure that you're speaking with your supervisor and asking them, what are the expectations? Because what I want to do is I want to get promoted at the 12 month mark. So what, what objectives do I need to accomplish in order to meet that, in order to get that? Because what you don't want to do is just sit there at your desk quietly and then 12 months comes by. And then all of a sudden you get surprised because your supervisor isn't, is telling you that you didn't meet the requirements and they're going to give you another year before they promote you. You don't want to be in a situation like that. So communication is going to work in your behalf. Make sure you're communicating. 
If you are not in a promotional ladder position, then it's whenever you want to get promoted. After 12 months of being there, you need to start applying. If you're a GS11 right now and you've been in your position for 12 months, whenever you feel that you're ready for a promotion, that's when you start applying for the GS12 position. I would start with the internal positions at your agency and then gradually move out to other agencies in your area and start applying for the GS12 positions. So overall, if you're a GS9, GS11, I wouldn't stay any longer. At the max, I would stay three or four years. And then it's time to go find your promotion. What I did personally, I actually waited 12 months, 12, 18 months, and I was out because I knew I wanted to get to a higher level. It depends on what your goals are. You know, how comfortable do you feel what's happening in your life right now? But if you know that you have the experience in, at the equivalent GS14, GS15 level, and you're an 11 right now, it should be one of your top priorities to climb up so that you can get paid at the level of where your experience is at, if that makes sense. All right. Let's see. Question from Art Hughes. Good morning, Art. Is it possible to receive a firm job offer after fingerprints even though equip is not completed yet. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I, what was your equip for? It was your equip for a uh, uh, secret or top secret. Sometimes it can take a while for the top secret clearance to come through. So I could see, uh, I can see an agency extending a firm job offer after the in initial background check. So you'll have uh, your standard I think it's NAS, N-A-S-C-I. You have your standard background check. And then after that's complete, they can give you a, a, a job offer. Now, sometimes it takes a, a while longer for the top secret clearance to go through the processing. So it's a possibility. Let's see. Okay, let's go. Another question. Next question. Let's drop that down. Okay, Patrick Walker, 6698, asks, why do they take so long to hire? Okay, this is something that's asked quite frequently. Most jobs, they'll get at least 100, 150 people applying. Let's say the average resume is five or six pages. If you have 100 people applying, five-page resume, that's 500 pages for one job announcement. It's kind of tough to read through all of that. And then if you're assigned more than one job announcement, it can easily exceed a thousand pages. So it's going to take a while to determine who is qualified, highly qualified, best qualified, and to actually send that over to the hiring manager. When the hiring manager gets it, they have to go through their own process. They have other things going on, right? The hiring manager isn't part of human resources. They have their own department, their own agency to run, and they have competing priorities. How badly do they want to onboard? How badly do they need somebody? If they need somebody really bad, then of course it's top of priority. They're going to shuffle through those resumes and they have to figure out who they want to who they want to interview. Now, I've seen hiring managers interview uh, two groups, uh, like 12 people, and they didn't like anybody. They didn't like anyone from the 12 people. So they asked Human Resource to publish the job announcement again. And the whole process starts over. So if you ask why it takes so long, is um, the easy answer is everything in the government takes a long time. But you have a lot of papers, a lot of uh, pages of resumes that have to be reviewed and shift through. It's a requirement that Human Resources looks at all the resumes. So I would say there's three check choke points when it comes to why does it take so long to get a government job. The first one is human resources. The second one is the hiring manager. And then the third one is the security team doing the background check because that could take a long time too, depending if they're backed up on, on, uh, on you know, background checks or not. That's why on average, it takes four to six months to get hired. And this is a lot longer than the private sector, obviously. So that's some of the reasons why it takes a while. Uh, next question is from Brian15732 who asks, can a GS-14-15 position apply for a GS-13 position for 100% remote work? If you get the job, would the pay likely be at step 10? Well, there's something called pay setting that some agencies can do, but they're not obligated to do. 
Most agencies would try to match your pay as close as possible. If you were a GS-15 and you have to go to the office every day and say you want a GS-13 position that's 100% remote work, then you could potentially see a step increase. It could be GS-13, step 8, step 9, step 10. This is not something that is forced. It's not mandatory. But I would say most agencies practice it, especially because it's a voluntary move downward. That's why it's not forced. But you can do it. Uh, you can try. Next question is from Julian88 Tex, who asks, excuse me. All right. Who asked, just wanted to confirm, is it only possible to negotiate during the tentative job offer phase? Yes, the tentative job offer phase, that's when you're negotiating. You want to do it before the final job offer. Before you accept the final job offer is when you want to negotiate. You want to do it by sending a memo to the human resource specialist showing that you're a, um, a highly qualified, not highly qualified, um, a superiorly qualified candidate. That's what you're trying to show. You're showing it with your experience, with your certification, with your education, with your accomplishments, all of that. It's packaged into a memo and it's submitted and you're trying to get a higher step level. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see. God's favor. I saw a job fair that would be held in, in Virginia. In Virginia or the Veteran Affairs, Virginia? I'd like to attend, but I'm not sure if there will be remote positions. I live four hours away. Do you think I should go? I don't know. Um, four hours away. So that's eight hours that you have to drive. I'm assuming you're driving. Eight hours. I'm not sure. I would actually, if you if what you're after is 100% remote work positions, I would try to find a point of contact to email for that hiring fair and inquire if there are any remote positions available. If they're going, if anyone's going to be there representing remote work positions, because if that's a hard line requirement for you and it's not there, then I definitely wouldn't go. But I did see there was a job fair recently that's in DC and it said that they were making on the spot job offers. I can't recall what agency it was. It's one that's coming up very soon. I almost included it in the newsletter, but it was in DC. So for the newsletter, I'm trying to just include the virtual hiring event so everyone can attend. But this one was specific to the D.C. area. It's on usajobs.gov. So I would look on there and see if you're interested. Anybody who's in the D.C. area, if they're interested in going to a hiring fair, that that um, they're actually doing job offers on the spot, then I would check that out. Um, let's see. Okay, Ray. Good morning, Ray. I work as a SharePoint developer and want to switch to government civilian on the GS scale. SharePoint, okay. However, it's hard to find jobs for my specific skill set. Do you have any suggestions? SharePoint developer, is it hard? Let's take a look. Let's take a, a quick look and see what we can find. Um, okay, SharePoint. So I'm assuming you probably already did this. Go to keywords, type in SharePoint. I'll put developer. And if we don't find anything there, we'll just put SharePoint. Oh, this one's only, it looks like only one job came up. Let's see. SharePoint. Okay. So this is a 0343 position, and they're looking for someone who's a technical expert at SharePoint, which seems to be right up your street. Yeah, SharePoint. Okay. So that's just one. That's discouraging. Let's take away developer and see if there's any other SharePoint. Okay, we have 144 jobs. Um, let's see where the job series are, are largely falling. Okay, 0301 is 23 jobs, probably 0343. Yeah, so I would look at... So for you, I would look at 0301, 0343. Right now, there's probably about 50 jobs that you can apply to. All of them are going to mention SharePoint. Um, this one right here, what is this? Is this a 0343? Uh, 0301, okay. Huh. Yeah, right here, SharePoint. Um, if you want to leverage your SharePoint skills, 
I would do it like this. I don't know if you're location dependent because what we see here is we have the you know DC area, DC, DC. We have one in Colorado, one in Georgia. But if you if you're not um, bounded by position, then there's over a hundred jobs you can apply for. If you are bounded by position, I would just include the location and run the run the search again. There are things out there uh, now. If you want a government job and the SharePoint stuff isn't working out, there's there's other ways that you can apply where you're not leveraging necessarily your SharePoint skill, but as a SharePoint as a SharePoint developer, you have other skills, and you would use that to find other you know other government jobs. So I would do that. Um, let's see. Next question, Alex: Would upgrade and, and clearance secret to top secret drag on the onboarding? It could. Um, it's really dependent on the security team that's managing your case because certain security teams are overwhelmed and other ones, you know, they're more efficient or they don't have as a big of a workload that they're dealing with. But it could be something, yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, next question. There's a lot of interest in remote work for obvious reasons. How likely is it receiving a job offer for one of these positions that seems very competitive? It's extremely competitive. How likely? Um, it just depends. I mean, some uh, I had a subscriber to the channel reached out to me the other day and they said, you know, thank you. I just landed a 100% remote position with HR. So it was a um, 0 200 job series. Just landed a 100% remote position. So I thought that was, that was great. That's not a common occurrence. Um, but... I know there's a deep interest when it comes to remote work. And as we just looked at right now, there's only 370. A few months ago, there were 600. So it looks like there's like a 40% reduction just in the last three months. Um, I think once we get the spending bill passed and approved, that's going to encourage more agencies to, to be open with their pocketbook, so to speak. And we could see more, more postings. I look at this number you know, at a minimum two or three times a week. So as it progresses, we'll see if it goes back up to the five, 600 range, or if it, if it stays at the 300, if it stays down at the 300s, it's going to be even more competitive. You know, there's some positions with the IRS where they had thousands of people. I think it was something like 13,000 people applied for one job announcement, but there's other ones where it'll be less than a thousand. Now I'll tell you what, people want remote work so bad that oftentimes they'll just apply to it. They won't even they won't even try to tailor their resume at all. So when these applications are coming in, like 60% of them are disqualified right off the bat because they just submitted garbage. They just took a they just took a generic, you know, resume that's not tailored at all and they just submitted it. Cause it's kind of like spraying and praying. You're hoping for a chance, but you're not putting the effort to actually get it. So 60% of them are out, you know, not even considered. So if you're consistently applying with a tailored, competitive, strong resume to these positions, it's possible. Um, if it's something that you you definitely want, I would I would say, you know, keep doing it. I wouldn't be discouraged and just give up. I, I wouldn't do that. All right. Let's see if we have any more questions. All right. Now, before we go on. To to let you to show you or just to kind of like double down on the point of sometimes you just have to keep going, you know, even if it's uh even if it feels discouraging. I was helping this fella this summer, you know, starting in March, right? This guy was applying to 100 percent remote work the, around the DC area. He was applying, applying, applying. And it took him a while. This guy was highly qualified. He had a really good resume. It took him a while. You see, from March 27th to August 4th. Now, the actual job offer that he got, that he accepted, was right here. It was right in the middle. It was in April. It was a job he applied to in on April 15th is, is the job he actually, he actually accepted this. It was a final job offer. He was onboarded. He's a GS-15 now. But look at this process. This is not something that's clear cut and easy. You got referred. You got people that don't even respond to you. The 0%, this is not referred. He was not referred. Strong resume, still not referred. This one is on him. Weak interview. 
he wasn't prepared for the interview. He had a tentative job offer, you know, interview. Sometimes you hear back, sometimes you don't. It's discouraging. But this guy, he kept going. He kept going and he got himself a GS-15. So it takes months sometimes. And you just got to stay the course and make sure that you're tracking it. Like I mentioned earlier on this stream, uh, you want to make sure that 50%, you know, over 50% of your applications are getting referred. If they're not, then you need to relook your resume. You need to make sure that you're tailoring it when you're applying to the job announcements. So make sure that you're keeping track. This is Notion. This Notion template, you can download it in the description below by clicking the link, or you can just create something in Microsoft Excel. Some people feel more comfortable in Excel, and that's fine too. But find a way to track it. Track your uh, job searching. Let's see. All right, enough about that. Okay. Let's see what else. Next question. I've been told, this is from Brian15732. I've been told that you should always give yourself the best score in the jobs posting questionnaire because if you don't, HR will likely not even review your resume. Is this true? There's truth to that because you're given points based on the answers that you're selecting in the questionnaire. If you rate yourself too low, you could be disqualifying yourself. And that's a shame. Once you're going through the questionnaire, if you find yourself saying, well, man, I'm not an expert in any of these things, then I would just stop, stop wasting time and go to another job announcement that's better suited for your experience. So make sure you're applying for jobs that you're qualified for. And if you're qualified for it, you should feel comfortable marking down that you're an expert in, in all of it or the vast majority of it. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to get you um, to be seen as eligible so that you have a shot at being referred. Okay. All right, let's see what else. All right. So we have any questions in the chat? Does the chat have anything? We got Jake. Good morning, Jake. So then will November on average have a lot more job postings on usajobs.gov? Well, that depends. If the government shuts down on November 17th, it won't. But if we're able to pass a spending bill, then yeah, probably. Probably November would look better than October. But I wouldn't wait for November. I would you know, continue and start applying today. All right. All right, guys. Thank Thanks, everybody, for showing up here. Hey, I just want to let everyone know again, do have a course, have interview, resume templates. If you're interested on how to construct a strong resume, there's templates down in the description below. You can download them for the 0300, 0340. There's 2210, there's 0560. So if you're interested in one of those job series and you want to see how a strong competitive resume looks like, then make sure you download it. Also, sign up for the free newsletter. Uh, right now, the tempo, the cadence is looking like once a week. I'm sending out information on free federal hiring events. You can take advantage of that. Also working on a couple of videos later today. The one that's coming out tomorrow is focused mo mainly on certifications. So people have asked often, do I need a certificate? Should I pursue a certificate? Would that make my application stand out more? Would that benefit my resume? And sometimes the answer is yes. With certificates, if you're interested in pursuing a certificate, or maybe you have one, what I would encourage you to do is go to usajobs.gov and that same search bar, type in your certificate. So for human resources, you could do PHR, which is professional in human resources. You can type that in and see how many job announcements actually mention it. Or for people that are interested in program management, the PMP, you know, that's a, that's a hot one as well. People say, hey, will the PMP help me in a government job? You can type in PMP and you can see what shows up. For IT, there's a plethora of certifications. So the video um, that's dropping tomorrow is going to talk more in detail about what certifications line up with job series. So hopefully that'll benefit some people. Um, if you have any suggestions or any video ideas that you'd like me to cover, please mention it in the chat or in the comments down below. And let's look down here, see if we have any other questions. Glenn, 
Sorry, where is the... Excuse me. All right. Where's the spreadsheet tracker you referenced? You would have to go to the... Um, I think it's the second link. And then it's, it's called a Notion template. It's the second link, I believe, if I'm correct. You should be able to find a Notion template there. Uh, another question... Okay, Abatostatin. Any recommendations for an emergency fund if the government shuts down? Should you have six? Absolutely. Should you have six months of future expenses saved? If you're able to, that should definitely be uh, a priority. I would say, depending on your age, depending on your financial circumstance, you should start trying to have at least one month of expenses paid, you know, uh, saved. And from one month, it should expand to three months. And then six months, and then probably 12 months if you're able to. That should be a goal always to have expenses paid. Because when a shutdown happens, as many of you know, you stop getting paid. You will not get paid until the government resumes, and then you will get back pay. Uh, so that can put a lot of people in a financial hardship. Not everyone is able to save six months or even three months of expenses. So I think that should be a goal. Uh, depending on your circumstance, it might not be possible, especially in the economic environment that we're all in today. But definitely, because if you do have, let's say if you have the six months, if you have that saved, then a shutdown is going to look like uh, for, for people that are in a good financial situation, they, they uh, sometimes even welcome a shutdown because then they can go and travel and do other things. And it's like taking a paid vacation because they're going to enjoy their time off. And then when the government opens back up, they'll get the back pay. And then they're not in a financial hardship because they had the money, you know, to support them. Other people, and I would say the majority of government workers are probably more in a situation where they're having to uh, deal paycheck to paycheck. They're having to deal with, um, with taking small loans out incurring more credit card debt and putting themselves further behind. And that's what most people are worried about. And there's also something else. If you're, if you're in a, under financial hardship, once the government shuts down, they'll give you a document. HR should give you a document and you can take that and you can file for unemployment. Now, once the government resumes, you have to pay that unemployment back, but that can help certain people out as well. So all right. So don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter down below. There's also a link you can schedule a call if you want to go more in detail with your with your situation, with your background, with your experience. I'll sit down in a call. I'll review your your uh, resume, and we can look at different job series, different strategies, different ways for you to get a government job. All that's available in the links in the description below. Thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday morning with me. I really appreciate it. Let's look one more time to see if we have any questions before we wrap this up. Let's see. Nope, it doesn't look like it. Okay. All right. Please click like, share. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.